Top 10 Accidental Inventions That Changed the World Anything can be possible if you have the right determination and passion to find novelty in mundane things. Things can be discovered, changed or reprocessed into phenomenal inventions. There are no specific rules and guidelines to make your imaginations and dreams come true. You just need a positive attitude, perseverance, and focus towards it. This creative outlook is the key reason behind the greatest inventions, so far in the past and now, which have fastened and improvised the modern era. These best inventions did not come with a map, or a plan, but by chance. When you think of people who invented something that is used daily in the world today, or something that has changed the world, you immediately think of, some clever scientist who recites physics formulae day and night, but that is not true for all inventors. Did you know? The person who invented Coca-Cola was actually trying to make a painkiller because he was wounded. Who knew that something that went so drastically wrong would one day be something that the whole world would drink? Learners Nation presents the list of 10 greatest accidental inventions that were not intended to be what they are today, were actually invented because of a mistake. Number 10, Adhesive Bandages. Many call it Band-Aid, and in Europe they call it Plaster. Many know it by name of elastoplast. Have you ever bled because of an accident? I think everyone has, sometimes you make mistakes and cut yourself. And did you know that some people just cut and tear their skin easier than others? Adhesive bandages come handy when you need small medical dressing for injuries not serious enough to require a full-size bandage. Josephine married a man who worked for a company that manufactured gauze and adhesive tape called Johnson & Johnson. Josephine Dixon was accident prone. During the first week that she was married to Earl Dixon, she cut herself twice with a kitchen knife. After that, it just went from bad to worse. It seemed that Josephine was always cutting herself while doing housework and cooking. Dixon found the gauze stuck to a wound with tape that did not stay on her active fingers. One day her husband had an idea. He sat down with some tape and gauze and a pair of scissors. Then he cut the tape into strips. In the middle of each strip he stuck a little square of gauze. From then on, whenever Josephine had an accident, ready-made bandages were on hand for her to use quickly and without much fuss. In the year 1920, Earl told his boss, James Wood Johnson, one of the co-founders of Johnson & Johnson, that he liked the idea and put it into production. The company installed machines for mass production of the new product, and the trade name, Band-Aid was adopted. However, Earl Dixon the inventor, was not totally ignored. Johnson & Johnson made him a vice president and later gave him a seat on the board of directors. To date, more than trillions of adhesive bandages are sold. It's very exciting to know how an invention designed for one person turns out to help so many people. The invention of adhesive bandage is a perfect example of a happy wife who makes a successful life. Number 9, Vulcanized Rubber. 19th century America was a good time to be an inventor. With the right timing, invention, marketing and patent, one could become rapidly rich. Many people reap the financial rewards of their business. Despite being the inventor of one of the most influential innovations of the past 200 years, Charles Goodyear was not like his peers. He was a self-taught chemist and manufacturing engineer who developed vulcanized rubber. But due to bad luck, losing a patent battle and rather lackluster marketing skills, Goodyear died little known and with massive debt, not to mention his rather tragic family life. What do you feel when the goal of your life, which you have devoted the last 15 years to, has been achieved? Since time immemorial, Indians used goods made from the sap of the rubber tree, played with natural rubber balls, covered boat bottoms, made shoes out of it. Natural rubber is one of the simplest natural polymers. But it becomes tacky and soft in warm weather, low elasticity, low tensile strength and resistance to wear and tear. At that time many people's minds were busy trying to get rid of this unpleasant properties of natural rubber, while keeping all its advantages. As they used to say, to cure natural rubber. Goodyear tackled these problems with passion. Working at home in the kitchen, by trial and error, he mixed natural rubber with all that was at hand, coal, sugar, salt, pepper, 
oil and ink, in the hope that some substance binds natural rubber. His path was thorny. Along the way were false hopes, disappointments, partner bankruptcies and family hunger. But in the end, Charles found a way to cure natural rubber. One day he accidentally dropped natural rubber mixed with sulfur into the fireplace. The burnt piece became exactly the way Charles Goodyear wanted to see it, hard and non-sticky, with higher tensile strength and resistance to wear and tear than natural rubber, it has a wide temperature range, with resistance to most chemical solvents. In addition it has high elasticity. Despite all of this, Goodyear spent trying to convince the world of the usefulness of his invention. Even finding a way to do, what he wanted most of his life, Charles was unable to make money on it. He spent all his money on exhibitions, patent disputes, and died in debt. Number 8. Plastic In the early 1900s, shellac was the material of choice, when it came to insulation, but due to the fact that it was made from Southeast Asian beetles, the material was not cheap to import. For this reason, the Belgian chemist Leo Backland thought he might be able to make some money by producing an alternative. What he came up with, however, was a moldable material that could be heated to extremely high temperatures without being distorted, also known as bakelite, the first fully synthetic plastic. He has been called the father of the plastics industry for his invention of bakelite, an inexpensive, non-flammable and versatile plastic that marked the beginning of the modern plastics industry. Bakelite was the first plastic invented that retained its shape after being heated with viable and cheap synthesis methods. Radios, telephones and electrical insulators were made of bakelite because of its excellent electrical insulation and heat resistance. Soon its applications spread to most branches of the industry. At Backlund's death in 1944, the world production of bakelite was 200,000 tons, and it was used in over 15,000 different products. When your tummy is rumbling, there's one kitchen appliance that can quickly stop the grumbling. From reheating leftover pizza to popping up some light and fluffy popcorn, there's one device that gets the job done. What are we talking about? The microwave oven, of course. Number 7 invention on the list is, microwave. You know the drill. You put your leftovers on a microwave safe plate, pop it into the microwave, hit a few buttons, and like magic, it's warm and ready to eat. And all this takes place within a few seconds rather than the minutes or hours that the stove and oven can take. Who is the genius who invented this wonderful creation? As a matter of fact, his name was Percy Spencer and his invention was an accident. Mr. Spencer worked for a company named Raytheon, developing microwave radar transmitters during World War II. One day in 1945, he noticed that the chocolate bar he had in his pocket was starting to melt. The microwaves from the radar set were cooking the chocolate bar in his pocket. With a little experimentation, Spencer figured that the microwaves could be concentrated in heating food. He created the first working microwave oven, and the first food he cooked in it was popcorn. Microwaves are absorbed by water, fats and sugars and are immediately converted to heat. The microwaves penetrate food quickly, so they cook food evenly and quickly. Microwaves are not absorbed by most plastics, glass or ceramics, so they are perfect for heating food without heating everything else around the food. This enables microwave ovens to use less energy than other cooking appliances. Today, millions of kitchens contain microwave ovens. You'll also find them in just about every restaurant kitchen, and quite a few convenience stores too. Whether you're heating up water for coffee, reheating leftovers for lunch or popping a bag of microwave popcorn for a late night snack, the microwave oven does these things quicker than any other appliance. And that's why it's so popular. Number 6. Safety Glass Safety glass is glass with additional safety features that make it less likely to break, or less likely to pose a threat when broken. Modern-day safety glass generally comes in one of four forms, tempered, laminated, wired mesh and engraved glass. These four approaches can easily be combined, allowing for the creation of glass that is at the same time toughened, laminated, and contains a wire mesh, however, combination of a wire mesh, 
with other techniques is unusual, as it typically betrays their individual qualities. But all this started with accidental invention of laminated glass. One of the most important rules in a research laboratory is to always, always make sure that your materials have been cleaned properly before they are put away. If chemical residue is left over, not only will future experiments be contaminated, but the resulting mixture could be dangerous, even explosive depending on what chemicals you are using. Every researcher is taught from day one how to properly dispose of waste and clean their glassware. Yet mistakes always happen. And, luckily enough for us, one of these mistakes just happened to result in an invention that actually improved laboratory safety in a huge way. In 1903, a French scientist, Edward Benedictus, was working in this laboratory when he needed to get certain chemicals from a high shelf. Grabbing his ladder, he climbed up to the top shelf, but accidentally knocked over a flask from a shelf below. Looking down at the broken glassware, Benedictus noticed something quite interesting, the glass had not completely shattered, as was to be expected. Instead, even though the glass was cracked and broken, it still retained its general shape. There were no glass shards scattered around the laboratory, and no sharp pieces of glass that could easily cut someone. After some investigation about this curious phenomena, the scientist learned that one of his assistants had been getting slightly lazy with cleaning his glassware, and had not completely removed the chemical inside. The solution, cellulose nitrate, was a liquid plastic which had evaporated and coated the interior of the flask with a thin film. This chemical prevented the glass from shattering, instead holding the pieces together. In 1903, automobile driving was a new and often dangerous hobby among Parisians. In the very week of Benedictus laboratory discovery, a Paris newspaper ran a feature article on the recent rash of automobile accidents. When Benedictus read that most of the drivers seriously injured had been cut by shattered glass windshields, Benedictus realized that this new material could greatly increase the safety of vehicles, as most car accidents resulted in the driver being harmed by shattered glass. Thus safety glass was developed, and since then it has been used in hundreds of different ways, from car windshields, to safety goggles, to chemical glassware. Without this lucky accident, the world may never have known the amazing properties of cellulose nitrate. Number 5. Stainless Steel Stainless steel is a versatile material. First used for cutlery it soon found its way into the chemical industry because of its corrosion-resistant characteristics. Today corrosion resistance is still of great importance and slowly but steadily the mechanical characteristics of the material are being recognized. It is material that keeps on finding its way into new applications on a close to daily basis. Nobody knows who invented steel. Its exact origins are lost throughout the history of mankind, attributed to early blacksmiths in China, India and Britain during the Industrial Revolution each who contributed in different ways to the development and proliferation of steel across the world. The invention of stainless steel, however, is a fascinating story. Steel may be incredibly tough, not to mention ductile and tensile, but that doesn't mean it is invincible. Steel is essentially made by adding carbon to iron, and iron inevitably will rust. For many years, metallurgists around the world attempted to overcome this frustrating obstacle. Experimentation with adding other elements to iron was fairly common, with moderate success. However, it wasn't until 1912 that a reliable method of mass-producing rust-proof steel was discovered. And it was entirely by accident. Of course, Inventor is an ambiguous term, especially with something as ubiquitous and elementary as steel. Corrosion-resistant steel, an alloy of iron and chromium, was first recognized in 1821 by Pierre Berthier, a French metallurgist. Despite this discovery, metallurgists of the time were unable to find the balance of high chromium and low carbon that makes modern stainless steel so effective. The products they were producing were too brittle for practical use. In 1872, two Englishmen named Clark and Woods patented an alloy that is very close to the modern equivalent of stainless steel, a combination of chromium and tungsten. For the next 40 years, more developments were made around the world, each noting the relationship between chromium and steel and the rust-proof result of a marriage between the two. However, 
These efforts were tedious and despite many patents being registered, no alloys were mass-produced or marketed to the general public. Then Harry Brurley came along. He was born in 1871 into a poor family who lived in one room. Harry Brurley made his name as a metallurgist when he discovered stainless steel in 1913. Harry Brurley worked out of the Brown Firth Research Factory in the industrial town of Sheffield, England. It was here that he spent countless hours seeking a strong alloy suitable for gun barrels, which were then known to wear down easily. This was not a simple task. His efforts lasted months, and while the pile of scrap metal next to his workbench rusted, he noticed something strange, a barrel gleaming among them. He pulled the shining barrel from the rusted heap and studied it. This particular sample contained roughly 12.8% chromium and 0.24% carbon. At that time, to properly inspect the microstructure of alloys they had to be polished and etched. This could be achieved by exposing it to a dilute solution of nitric acid in alcohol. However, this sample, he saw, was very resistant to chemical attack. Within three weeks he perfected a hardening process for the alloy. He named the invention rustless steel. At the time, Sheffield was known for its production of quality cutlery, and in this market, Burley quickly saw a place for his invention. Back then, cutlery was usually made from steel or silver. Steel would rust easily and had to be cleaned constantly to avoid contamination. Silver, on the other hand, was far too expensive for most people. Burley approached an old friend, Ernest Stewart, with his invention. Stewart was a manager at Portland Works, a cutlery work for Sheffield. He tested Burley's alloy in a vinegar solution and when it remained unmolested he renamed it stainless steel. Next time you enjoy your dinner with a rust-free knife, forks and spoons remember to thank all the metallurgists. Number 4, X-ray Images in today's world, doctors order X-rays to diagnose all sorts of problems, broken bones, pneumonia, heart failure, and much, much more. Mammography, the standard screening method for breast cancer, uses X-rays. We barely think about it, it's so ubiquitous. But not so long ago, a broken bone, a tumor, or a swallowed object could not be found without cutting a person open. In 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen, a German physics professor, was performing an experiment using cathode rays, while testing whether cathode rays could pass through glass. His cathode tube was covered in heavy black paper, so he was surprised when an incandescent green light nevertheless escaped and projected onto a nearby fluorescent screen. Then he realized that some fluorescent cardboard across the room was lighting up. This was in spite of the fact that there was a thick block between the cathode ray and the cardboard. The only explanation was that light rays were actually passing through a solid block. Rentgen realized that some invisible rays coming from the tube were passing through the cardboard to make the screen glow. He found they could also pass through books and papers on his desk. Rentgen threw himself into investigating these unknown rays systematically. Through experimentation, he found that the mysterious light would pass through most substances but leave shadows of solid objects. Because he did not know what the rays were, he called them X, meaning unknown rays. Two months after his initial discovery, he published his papers. Rentgen discovered its medical use when he made a picture of his wife's hand on a photographic plate formed due to X-rays. The photograph of his wife's hand was the first photograph of a human body part using X-rays. News of his discovery spread worldwide. And within a year, doctors in Europe and the United States were using X-rays to locate gunshots, bone fractures, kidney stones and swallowed objects. Honors for his work poured in, including the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Number 3, Radioactivity The discovery of radioactivity took place over several years, beginning with the discovery of X-rays in 1895 by Wilhelm Röntgen and continuing with such people as Henry Becquerel and the Curie family. The application of X-rays in radioactive materials is far-reaching in medicine and industry. Radioactive material is used in everything from nuclear reactors to isotope-infused saline solutions. 
These technologies allow us to utilize great amounts of energy and observe biological systems in ways which were unthinkable less than a century ago. But first, what is radioactivity? Radioactive decay occurs in unstable atomic nuclei that is, ones that don't have enough binding energy to hold the nucleus together due to an excess of either protons or neutrons. One example of a radioactive substance is uranium. In nuclear power plants, uranium is used to produce electricity. When radioactive substances like uranium produce radiation, they also create a lot of heat. The term radioactivity refers to the particles emitted. Wilhelm Röntgen opened the door for radioactive discovery by discovery of X-rays in 1895. In 1896, the French scientist Henri Becquerel was working on an experiment involving uranium-enriched crystals. He believed that sunlight was the reason that crystal would burn its image on a photographic plate. With dark clouds rolling in, Becquerel packed up his gear and decided to continue his research on another sunny day. A few days later, he retrieved the crystal from a darkened drawer, but the image burned on the plate above was fogged. The crystals emitted rays that fogged the plate, but were dismissed as weaker rays compared to William Röntgen's X-ray. Becquerel wouldn't go on to put a name on the phenomena. He left that for two fellow scientists, Pierre Curie and Marie Curie. Though it was Henry Becquerel that discovered radioactivity, it was Marie Curie who coined the term radioactivity. Using a device invented by her husband and his brother that measured extremely low electrical currents, Curie was able to note that uranium electrified the air around it. Further investigation showed that the activity of uranium compounds depended upon the amount of uranium present and that radioactivity was not a result of the interactions between molecules, but rather came from the atom itself. Curie found that thorium was radioactive as well. She later discovered two new radioactive elements, radium and polonium, which took her several years since these elements are difficult to extract and extremely rare. Unfortunately, the Curies died young. Pierre Curie was killed in a street accident and Marie died of aplastic anemia, almost certainly a result of radiation exposure. In 1909 at the University of Manchester, Ernest Rutherford was bombarding a piece of gold foil with alpha particles. Rutherford noted that although most of the particles went straight through the foil, one in every 8,000 was deflected back. Recalling in 1936 the discovery of the nucleus in 1909 Rutherford said, It was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell on a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you, he concluded that though an atom consists of mostly empty space, most of its mass is concentrated in a very small, positively charged region known as the nucleus, while electrons buzz around on the outside. Rutherford was also able to observe that radioactive elements underwent a process of decay over time which varied from element to element. In 1919, Rutherford used alpha particles to transmute one element oxygen into another element nitrogen. The papers at the time called it splitting the atom. We now have the essentials to utilize radioactive elements. Röntgen gave us X-rays, Becquerel discovered radioactivity, the Curies were able to discover which elements were radioactive, and Rutherford brought about transmutation and the splitting of the atom. Number 2, the first practical implantable pacemaker. A lot can happen in a minute. In the world of scientific invention, a minute can be pivotal. A spark can trigger a life-changing idea for an inventor in a minute, and 60 seconds is all it takes for an inventor to make a huge mistake. In some extraordinary cases, perhaps both phenomena can occur at that same moment in time. This was the case for Dr. Wilson Great Batch, an inventor who, in just a minute, made an error that led to a life-saving invention and forever changed cardiovascular health care. In 1956, while working as an assistant professor in electrical engineering at the University of Buffalo, he reached into a box of parts for a resistor to complete the circuitry while building a heart rhythm recording device for the Chronic Disease Research Institute there. The one he pulled out was the wrong size, and when he installed it, the circuit it produced emitted intermittent electrical pulses. He associated the timing and rhythm of the pulses with the human heartbeat, 
after which he soon began experiments to shrink the equipment and shield it from body fluids. The first Great Batch pacemaker was implanted in a human patient in 1960, and Great Batch was awarded a patent for the device two years later. Indeed, a minute can be transformative. A healthy human heart beats an average of 50 to 70 times per minute. But for an ailing heart, a minute can mean the difference between life and death. Ultimately, Greed Batch invention of the implantable pacemaker has extended and saved millions of lives worldwide. Number 1, Penicillin. In the era before antibiotics bacterial infections were a serious problem. Common diseases that are easily treatable today, such as strep throat sinus infections and air infections, were far more dangerous and debilitating. Physical injury particularly burns carried high risk of wound infection, which can be deadly. In the year 1927, Fleming had been investigating the properties of Staphylococci bacteria, he was already well known for his earlier work and had developed a reputation as a brilliant researcher but his laboratory was often untidy. In the year 1928, Fleming returned to his laboratory having spent August on holiday with his family. Before leaving he had stacked all his cultures of Staphylococci on a bench in the corner of his laboratory. On returning, Fleming noticed that one culture was contaminated with a fungus, and that the colonies of Staphylococci immediately surrounding the fungus had been destroyed, whereas other Staphylococci colonies, farther away were normal. Fleming grew the mold in a pure culture and found that it produced a substance that killed a number of disease-causing bacteria. He identified the mold as being from the genus Penicillium. He investigated its positive antibacterial effect on many organisms, and noticed that it affected bacteria such as Staphylococci and many other bacteria that cause scarlet fever pneumonia meningitis and diphtheria. Fleming published his discovery in 1929, in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology, but little attention was paid to his article. Fleming continued his investigations but found that cultivating penicillium was quite difficult, and that after having grown the mold, it was even more difficult to isolate antibiotic agents. Fleming's impression was that because of the problem of producing it in quantity, and because its action appeared to be rather slow, penicillin would not be important in treating infection. Fleming didn't have the resources to fully develop his discovery. Other bacteriologists tried to purify penicillin but failed. Finally, in 1939, Howard Florey, a pathology professor at Oxford University, read Fleming's paper in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology, and he and his colleague Ernst Boris Chain worked to purify and create usable penicillin with funds from the US and British governments. After churning out a good amount of mold filtrate per week and testing on animals, they were finally able to try a new drug on a human. On February 1941, Albert Alexander got his first dose of penicillin, and the treatment started to heal him of a life-threatening infection in just a few days. Unfortunately, the Oxford team ran out of the drug before Alexander was completely healed, and he died. The first successful treatment happened a year later in 1942. It was given to Ann Miller, a patient at New Haven Hospital in Connecticut who had suffered a miscarriage and developed an infection that led to blood poisoning. In 1945, Fleming Florey and Ernst Chain received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery of penicillin. This discovery estimated to have saved over 200 million lives. Fleming's accidental discovery of penicillin changed the world of modern medicine by introducing the age of useful antibiotics. Penicillin has saved and is still saving millions of people. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.